Hello and welcome to our community call. Today is Thursday, July 7th. I can't believe it's already July. Somehow that happened, but welcome to both our community call and to a week into being a week into July, everyone. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about project management and sort of the intersection of project management and impact networks. Uh, if anyone has any other um, topics they want to bring up either in that regard or, or we can leave some time at the end to go in a, in a different direction, if anything. But I definitely do want to start off with providing at least a couple of updates on the project management side and really going from there uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, just at least having a bit of a discussion of kind of project management and network mindset. So I'll just take a, a step back overall at SCURF. Uh, you know, here we're uh, we're we're working on sort of the intentional mission of facilitating between industry and academia, thinkers and doers, researchers and builders, whatever dichotomy you want to do of people who are living in the applied world or the theoretical world versus the applied world, and how do we best facilitate knowledge, both uh, facilitate knowledge interaction, facilitate any any of the components that are necessary for people coming up with new ideas they wouldn't have had before, moving it forward, etc. Right, so. Uh, in that context, that, that is sort of the overall mission of SCURF, for us to actually be able to literally do anything and have any processes, we need folks who are thinking about, well, what are our processes? How are we staying organized? Uh, how are we creating actual functional operationalizable plans to go from a, a concrete place where we find ourselves today and a theoretical, you know, wonderful uh, utopic vision of the, what the future of research in Web3 and interactions around research can be. And so I know in, in a lot of environments uh, and having worked in the corporate world before, there's in a lot of places, project management is something that can be anywhere from a glorified administrator of like, here are your three things, just do your three things, but we're going to call you a project manager to make you feel better about yourself. All the way through, you are a dynamic team lead, you are building new functions, you are starting new things, but you are expected to also document process, you know, lead processes and support some other people so you can still get that distinction of a project manager. And at the end of the day, and why I'm so excited to kind of link it to this whole Impact Network book, is it, in my view, when we start, a key part of being a good project manager is actually thinking through that kind of network mindset as it was brought up in the book of, we are not here just for a, a concrete thing ending, but that thing exists within a system and we're here for advancing the overall system and collective, right? We are here as just but one node in a larger uh, drama that is playing out and we are trying to uh, steer our portion of the ship in a direction that we can all hopefully collectively accomplish things that we wouldn't have been able to separately. And so I think that mix of thinking through what are all the, the types of functions that fall into project management from, you know, there's already a plan in place, I am here to but execute, all the way through we need to come up with plans for how to do a thing that we don't even know how to do yet. Uh, so going from the very clear to the very unclear. Um, and putting it in this wider context of this network, of the fact that we are right, we are not just here uh, for a, a very narrow, uh, concrete, limited mission. We are here to solve a very hard problem that probably no one group alone can solve. So we are but one node in the solution, right? And how do we generally advance as many folks as possible towards solving that actual core problem, which is you know these silos of knowledge, the fact that knowledge communication isn't moving around as clearly as it should, uh, and again, how do we facilitate the interactions, the knowledge exchange, etc., to help more, uh, as started coming up recently, to help more aha or light bulb moments kind of go off for people uh, of like, oh, I didn't realize I could do a thing, now I realize I could do it, and hopefully go make some advance in this space. So I, I probably have roughly five to 10-ish minutes of ramble uh, roughly prepared on my end. Um, I would much prefer to turn this into a conversation uh, a, a, as early as possible. So um, first off, I just want to remind folks, please feel free to cut off with hand raises. If you want to throw out comments, suggestions, uh, anything like that in the chat, please feel free. I'm keeping an eye on it. Uh, but I, I at least want to take a pause for a moment and maybe ask, well, first of all, does anyone have any general thoughts? Does that make sense? Any pushbacks? And if not, great. Oh, Peter, please. OK, hello. Hey, hello, can you hear me? Yes. OK, Peter, hello, we can hear you. Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, can you hear fine, me? fine, yeah. fine. Okay, fine, fine. Beautiful. Uh, first of all, I want to appreciate uh, the initiative. Although I 
could not, uh, where I was last community call, I could not comment. It was a very beautiful presentation uh, last week, talking about, you know, linking, networking, and all of that. Uh, but there are some aspects we need to uh, draw some uh, clarification. Uh, talking about uh, project management, um, um, we already have a, a functional system, so to speak. I, if I may ask, are we looking at project management in terms of individual activity or uh, uh, unit activity or project management in terms of individual task? Why I ask this is that it depends on the, the application uh, differ. Okay, if we are looking at uh, maybe in an agile environment, which we are, uh, what we have is an agile environment, things are coming and it's changing and all that. So we are uh, dynamically adjusting towards it. So I, I want to be sure so that when we have this understanding on the application of this uh, particular um, tools, project management is a tool, who we'll know how we can uh, effectively function and use it. I know uh, I've managed projects before, and uh, in project management, basically we have a uh, tool from Prince2 and the PMI that is uh, popularly uh, uh, known worldwide, apart from this Chrome that is also coming in, which is the Agile uh, form. Uh, the definition of what we intend to do is sacrosanct before you can apply those uh, form of methodologies. So once we are able to highlight them, then link them together to the actual result we want. And we know that project management is a complete cycle. And once it's done, the project is delivered. Then it's now in production. So those are the things I want us to also uh, put that in our thoughts so that to properly guide us once we go on, on this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Peter. And I think you're you're bringing up a few important elements of sort of the the overall complexity of what project management fully entails and could be as well. So yeah, I, I appreciate you 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 bringing that up. And you know, I think to to your point, uh, you know, we definitely want to have uh, elements that outline, uh, and these are are still works in progress. So we will share these once these are finalized, right? But we want to have some flow of well, what is the actual life cycle? of something and what is actually part of the project management or project proposal process and project execution process, evaluation process, right? There's all these different components and stages of what are we talking about? And I know you mentioned like Scrum or Agile or PMI, or there's a bunch of different frameworks of how to effectively think of, you know, what is the goal of what we're doing? What is the thing that we're trying to accomplish on what timeline with what budget? Uh, and then actually creating a concrete plan. And then how do we continuously ensure that we are checking in on the plan and making sure we're staying on track uh, and mechanisms to make sure that we're staying on track until there's some either completion or milestone uh, because I guess there are, especially depending on how you define like a project or an epic as a, a collection of projects feeds up into an epic. And um, yeah, there's sort of the, the discussion also to be had of like, does every project truly have a clear start and end date? Or is it just the phases of it that you need to create those dates so you actually have something to work with? Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of, thank you for bringing up both, both some concrete and philosophical elements uh, of project management. And you know, for us at, at its core, and especially where it started, it was this idea, uh, and hopefully everyone has seen this, but in case anyone has not seen this, here is uh, our first GitHub, uh, board, or I don't remember if chronologically, I'm guessing this was our second, I think the content pipeline was probably the first one. Um, but this is one of our first two boards where we were generally just trying to capture, hey, here are projects going on. And if you click through a bunch of these, uh, and I will just click through some of my own, you will see that there is not always uh, a standard. And this time I did actually use it, but there are other times when we did not use a specific standard. And so, you know, creating templates and now having different kinds of boards and a single view where we can understand what are the projects we're working on, uh, how are we actually tracking and managing them, and having that kind of project level uh, clarity is very important. And on the other side, as you mentioned, Peter, kind of making sure that that is not just happening in isolation of discussions of larger strategy and mission for the organization, but everything from you know a super high level multi-year roadmap should integrate into the highest level of project views, which should integrate into the actual functional of like where are people doing work and having all of the different kind of layers of the project clearly articulated and linking back to the overall strategy and mission of the organization. So. 
we are definitely, uh, and thanks to to uh, Tuan and Brian, uh, we are definitely making a lot of strides uh, on the GitHub side. And especially if anyone has worked with the discovery team and seen the discovery board or the doc board, or now I know on the IT, um, I think it's just called the IT board or, or proposal board for IT. But now there's a, a variety of different, much more nuanced ways that we can actually uh, have useful tooling to just be able to see what is the nature of, of the work that's going on at SCR, uh, right? So there is the, you know, part of this and what the project management group that that uh, has recently been assembled with, with I, I see at least a few folks here who are a part of that and helping out there, right? We are actually going through and updating, well, what is our, what is the life cycle of a project as we're defining it at Scurp? What What is the doc you use to propose it? What is the doc you use to write out the process? What is the doc you use uh, to actually track the work that that's done? And what is done in, in say Google Docs versus what's done in GitHub? And how do you link between the two? And that way, if someone new joins the team, how do we expedite uh, a new person's onboarding? Because being able to expedite someone's onboarding and on-ramp into a new project is the equivalent of that group being well aware of uh, what's going on and we have everything documented and we kind of have the knowledge landscape around the project in place. Um, so I, I do see that as a goal of being able to easily onboard people into a new project as a good rule of thumb, even if no one is being planned on getting added to the project, because that's just a high bar of if, if you know you're in a place where you can quickly on-ramp someone, you've done your docs, you've done your process, you've clarified your mission, like you have all your ducks in a row to be able to accomplish that. So I, in my mind, uh, that's usually a bar I like to try to hit when possible, uh, because that's when you know things have progressed enough that it's a, it's a more mature project that is uh, sustainably moving forward and not just kind of being slapped together as, a, as, as we're, uh, what is it, building the ship as we're flying it, or plane, not, I don't know, many flying ships. Um, but yeah, thank you for, for bringing that up, Peter. And I guess I, I would also want to ask, uh, in general, if this kind of intersection of network mindset and project management, especially for us at Skirp, right? I'm not talking about project management objectively in the world. I'm sure project management at a BNY Mellon or a very, I don't know why I chose them, but of a highly centralized traditional organization um, versus any kind of decentralized environment, right? What does it actually mean to be a project manager? And that's where I, I want to come back to uh, within the, uh, the book uh, of Impact Networks, right, where he talked about the different network leadership roles, where there was the catalyzing, the facilitating, the weaving, uh, and then there was a separate bit that also talked about, um, you know, the, the, the seed groups that actually need to be formed to then create the initial momentum and energy for a network to start potentially forming. Um, and all of that in the context of the network mindset, again, where it's not thinking about individual uh, focus or goal, but all of it in the context of the, of the much wider collective. For, for me, that actually really resonates because uh, right in a much more expanded view of what a project manager does, and especially here at SCRP where we are not a massive multi-million person organization with, you know, whatever, uh, we're, we're a small, lean, public good, network-based organization. It's not as though most of us will just have like one style of role to fill in the entire time we are here. And I think this view of right knowing when we become the catalyzer and the leader versus facilitator versus weaver versus coordinator, and especially when reading into the coordinating and some of the other aspects described, right? We need to clearly articulate uh, right our purpose, our our mission. What are we trying to do? All these other things. So um, from that perspective, I think it's it's. It, at least I like thinking of this kind of PM as this very dynamic role in these kind of network environments. But I'll pause there because I see Chris has his virtual hand up, please. Yeah, um, I think in observing the way the organization has evolved, the notion of a single uh, project manager is more centralized than decentralized, which is where I think SCRF has done a good job of uh, distributing the role of a traditional project manager among multiple positions. And I think that's where it, the reason it's been able to evolve uh, is because there are, <clears throat> within the organization, there are managers and there are project managers, but one person is not responsible for the entire organization's like existence and it's broken down in a way that a traditional organization having a single project manager, um, I think establishes uh, 
like that that person has to have a top down and bottom up view of the organization in a way that nobody else really has to um and by proxy that person also has to be qualified to uh, assign tasks and create dependencies and understand the trajectory of the organization while also coordinating with it with people and uh, groups within the organization but that's also where I think SCRF has actually done a really good job of as I said like there's a content manager and then there's like a team manager and then there's a community manager and traditionally I think in other organizations a lot of those responsibility would have been uh, would have fallen under one umbrella as a project manager and I think it's better to sort of articulate like yeah the person who's establishing communication with individuals isn't necessarily the same person who's going to be organizing the team uh, overall strategies and, that. and while it could be one person in the spirit of decentralization but also in this experiment that is scurf i think it is better uh the way that things have evolved Absolutely. And I appreciate you bringing that up. And I, I think for me that uh, that brings up the, these quotes I just dropped in chat from the book where it, it's this double sided thing of right to be that good leader, which inherently means not being a persistent leader, but being comfortable taking it on at the right points in time is inherently deeply having this network mind sh mindset uh, embedded already. And I know in general, it, like that is not I at least I don't think it, in for those who are also from, uh, you know, raised on in the in the West, at least that's where I was, so I can only speak from experience. There's a lot of conditioning that does not feed one to think in this kind of way. At least having gone through like the public schooling system in the United States of like uh, 90s through 2000s, um, no, none of that was teaching me to think in that way. It was much more individualistic, very different side of the style of culture. And even with my own uh, mental health dispositions and whatnot, and uh, I, I generally thought about these things from a, that mental health perspective as well, because that, that's a whole separate discussion we can have. But I, I think that kind of viewing oneself as part of a larger collective is a very healthy thing on, on that side as well. Um, but I, I, I do think that the amount of work that it actually takes to be able to consistently think this way because like I, I, right if we were having a candid discussion that wasn't recorded and i asked everyone here like honestly in the last week how many times have you been asked to do something or a problem presented itself and the thought that naturally came up first in your mind was like well that's not my problem i don't want to deal with that and like that that's not even met in any kind of critical way it's just that the, the landscape of potential responsibility versus the landscape of desired responsibility, there's almost always a gap in between those. And especially like our natural wiring and conditioning, especially from like an evolutionary biology perspective, keeps us centered at the center of our own existence for some very concrete reasons. And so, excuse the, 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 the ramble, but it's sort of what are the things that can get us thinking this way in the first place? Because I would love to see, and like this is also just very direct for SCURF, right? I hope that people are getting that this is also a bit of a call to action of if you see things that should be happening and they are not, right? Should is one of those, uh, I think it's one of the, the, the most dangerous words in the English language, because if it should, well, then come help us, right? Like help us do that thing. And uh, the, the goal here and in general is we're not trying to build an overly hierarchical way where a few people decide how we're gonna try to, you know, solve the facilitation problem around knowledge and research. Uh, but it's much more about how do we create the system where we can empower more and more people to solve the, the relevant problems that help us all collectively achieve the, that kind of mission. Um, so yeah, sorry, I, got, I, I went off on a bit of a tangented road there. But I, I would love to kind of follow up, and I don't know, Chris, if you feel comfortable jumping in or if anyone else, but what are things that that can help move people in that direction, right? And like, what can we be doing uh, at SCURF to make people feel more comfortable stepping up as leaders in certain areas, um, whether from a process and procedure perspective or a culture perspective, right? We might think that we're empowering everyone to do certain things, and then in reality, no one actually feels empowered, and there could be a gap there too. So yeah, just using this as a as a room for for discussion in that direction. If anyone's keen on it, um, I think one of the best things to do is just ask people. Um, and I'll I'll draw upon an example where um, at some point 
we were talking about, uh, you know, uh, there was a discussion during another community call, and it was about whether SCRF was a welcoming organization, and I just asked the people in the conversation if it felt welcoming. I think it's like, we can infer things, or we can just open lines of communication, um, and I think, obviously, we've been moving toward the communication lines anyway, but I uh, the way that we've moved to sort of weave conversation in discord so that the things that happen in the community calls are being documented in the chat and then they're being posted on Twitter to bring in people in the conversation. Um, I think just having active uh, outreach where we're like inviting people to let us know how they think we're doing or how how they perceive us and continue continuously keeping that line of communication open um yeah like having specific surveys is great too um and that's like a, a step further so that's definitely in, in line with what i'm suggesting so it's just more so i think if if we stopped doing that then people would be more inclined to not participate at a uh, novice level, but I think we, we do a really good job about making people feel welcome no matter what their expertise level. And it's part of continuously like asking like that, that person, how can we make our information more accessible or how can we make ourselves uh, more open and receptive? I'm muted. Absolutely, yeah, and thank you for bringing that up. And uh, yeah, Paul mentioned uh, in the chat that Faith and Tamara actually, or Faith and Tanya, excuse me, are currently working on uh, some surveys that might help us in that direction. And I think in general, as we're thinking of what role UX plays, and there's much more that we can do in terms of formally trying to capture uh, some of people's journeys and what's going well and what isn't. But yeah, the other side of, uh, of what I was hearing you say is also the culture side. And I hope that People feel comfortable approaching folks who you do know here, or if you just get here uh, via Discord and, and meet someone new uh, and get to, hopefully you feel comfortable asking them those kinds of questions. And I understand that a recorded public conversation is not the place to uh, solicit feedback in the most comfortable manner. Uh, though if anyone does want to give any public feedback, please, you are more than welcome to. Um, but yeah, hopefully as a, as a result of this in general, uh, we do want to figure out more ways that we can best learn from folks in how we can improve. So uh, yeah, that, that is a general call to action right in this context of project management, network leadership, net network mindset. If you see things that you think we could be doing better, like please come be part of helping SCURF become its best version of itself and reach out to any of the core folks on our team uh, and uh, or just hop in our Discord and we're, we're always more than happy to, to chat about it. Um, and yeah, and in terms of what, how do you, how does one build a culture that encourages network leadership I think is also a really interesting one because when it's a when it's a small group, if there were four of us here, I think it's much easier to then say, hey, like we, we are gonna build a culture where we all kind of cycle in and out of leading versus supporting versus this and that and kind of all collectively taking on the burden. But once the organization gets to a certain point where we probably have, you know, somewhere in the 30 to 50 range of pretty active contributors here, um, that's already a, a much bigger group size. And people feel, you know, right, if we did a, an actual uh, social network graph of SCURP, we would see there would be certain breaks and disjointedness and how do we actually, as we keep growing and scaling, what can we do to actually encourage people, excuse me, to take on leadership where they see those opportunities and to deeply embed that as part of our culture here to the point when people just get here, what's the soonest they can get that that's the gist, right? Because if you didn't get invited here, if no one held your hand into SCURF and you just showed up because you, you were Googling or whatever, um, how do we actually make that clear to new folks and beyond these community calls and actual live interaction points? Um, I'm not asking this question as just conversation fodder. Like I, it is a very unclear question. I would love to brainstorm more. And I see uh, Chris has his hand up, so I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah, I had a discussion with uh, an administrator at a, an educational institution yesterday. And he asked a similar question. And I actually drew upon our recent reading group as a, a method of establishing that type of uh, 
common framework in a language that allows the people within the organization to get on the same page to move forward. Because, and I also suggested him the impact networks specifically, but I think as an exercise, having everyone read the same material and then discuss it was a way that it builds a cultural uh, net that keeps the conversation at a level and never allows the conversation to fall, fall below it, but then allows the conversation to go somewhere further than if we had not come together and read the same material, got on the same page about the lexicon, and then had a discussion about how we can apply that to the organization. So whether it's like once a quarter or what, I do think it was like extremely useful as an organization to like take uh, some educational material about networks and organizations, read it, and then figure out how we can apply it to our organization. And that was like, that exercise is something I've never really seen done anywhere else. But having now gone through it as an organization, I think that's something that could be like a regular practice that we do. For sure. And I, I very much, uh, at least, right, because I think uh, the role that reading groups can play at SCURF is its own big question because there's multiple types. And, you know, is it around research? Is it around the network and how to SCURF better or, uh, around fun or just like social and let's read fiction and just uh, and just build bonds together kind of stuff? Um, so, yeah, there, there's all different kind of directions. That actually reminds me of something I just forgot to plug and the community should be aware of because why not um, is. Um, so protocol labs, DSI labs, and SCURF are coming together. We're we're more supporting. We're not actively running it in any kind of way as of yet. We're really more just supporting protocol labs and DSI labs as they co-run uh, sort of an open science meta research, how to do research better kind of reading group. Uh, so I will uh, figure out. I actually don't remember Paul if they sent us the public info for that, but we will figure out what is the right version to share within our community. Uh, just so that in case anyone is interested, they, they can be aware of that. Um, but anyway, coming back to what you were mentioning. So yeah, I, I do really want to continue with more readings along those lines. Uh, I know I just uh, finished the, um, the Idea Factory, which is the, the book on Bell Labs and like their innovation environment. Uh, and that's an interesting candidate. I've also been thinking about what are sort of the, the personal side that we can cover. Uh, without potentially getting too heavy. One of my favorite books on that side is Man's Search for Meaning. That that might be a, a heavier book as a collective to read. Um, so yeah, we, we can figure out balance. If anyone has concrete ideas from the system perspective, from the personal development as it pertains to system, like please let me know. A, I just love that kind of content generally. Um, I know I listened to a podcast series last night on the evolution of DARPA and their role in innovation and military and innovation and tech and whatnot. So uh, very open to that it doesn't just need to be books because I get that if it's podcasts or articles, we could potentially do these more frequently. But um, at least for now, I, I will keep throwing out a few of these ideas um, as I have bandwidth to. If anyone wants to work with me specifically on this how to skirt better reading group on the systems level focus on the personal development side on all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, please reach out. Happy to chat more in that direction. So yeah, let me pass it off to, to Muhammad because I know he's been patiently waiting. Yeah, just to circle back to the question about um, about how to make sure that the I forgot what the question was, but I remember what my answer was. Um, it, it, it's about um, there, there's a there's an idea out there in the business community and in the tech business community of like an operating system for an organization. Uh, if you read John Doerr, uh, if you've heard of like uh, OKRs or uh, Gino Wickman's uh, Traction. I've seen that operated in multiple companies. I've uh, attempted to implement it myself. And uh, when you are really, really explicit about where the organization is going and uh, kind of like you have shared goals, uh, it, it motivates and allows people to be able to, to move in that direction to some extent independently. And if you're explicit that, if you're explicit about what those um, expectations are or what the norms are, then um, if something comes up in a meeting where somebody's like, well, no, we're going to have to do it this way. And it's like, 
that doesn't really fit with our values. Like most people working in a company don't actually know the company's core values, can't recite its mission statement from memory because it's usually some long drawn out, we strive to uh, bring superior whatever. They don't really know what they're doing. Um, the only challenge though is when, when, I mean, this is just speaking from a leadership perspective. If we're going to be introducing, if for lack of a better word, operating system level information uh, to across the organization, we really need to be sure that that it fits. And I want to I want to actually um, give a give a give a couple thumbs up to Eugene because I, I do think Impact Networks uh, is is so relevant for for us, but. Um, but I would say that there, there might need to be some care uh, around that um, and that it might make sense to uh, coalesce around the, the shared understandings and learnings that we have around this so that, so that the culture can be somewhat explicit, not rigid, right? I mean, the U.S. Constitution has an elastic clause, but, but it, might be, uh, it might be worthwhile to 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 make sure that we've kind of codified some aspects of this if we if we truly believe that what we what, what we're seeing in impact networks applies to scurf and that we at this point at least don't want to see ourselves massively deviate from that then uh yeah maybe maybe it's a lot no i mean you know we could ask people to read the book but that might cost money but to be really explicit about what the ideals of the organization are, what the motivating uh, opportunities are, et cetera, um, that, that, that can actually be quite liberating for an organization, regardless of its uh, self-imagined structure. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. And that's something that I know has been uh, coming up again. And in the, in the chat, there's a, a bit of a discussion around uh, the idea of revisiting norms and explicitly stating norms. And so I, interesting timing this has been coming up in a few different conversations internally both as part of the the general website build as part of some onboarding stuff as yeah so it, it, it's come up so it seems as though now is an appropriate time and uh yeah thinking through and more explicitly stating so to provide that clarity of purpose and mission um is important and clearly if people aren't feeling like they're capturing it clearly that means we need to do a better job clearly stating it uh, and so that's something that, that has definitely been uh on on our mind in the last week or so as it started coming up again more uh so yeah this seems like maybe we're doing our quarterly or bi quarterly or biannual or whatever cadence we get into uh, it seems like now is is one of those uh points so if there's anyone else besides the folks who have explicitly just spoken about it or, or mentioned it in chat if this is a topic that interests you and you have strong thoughts opinions feelings seen it done well go horribly wrong etc uh please let me know uh yeah uh, muhammad stephanie and chris will definitely follow up with y'all uh as we as we do formal revisiting here uh but yeah if there are if there is anyone else please uh please dm me on uh discord or just drop a chat here and i'll make sure to keep you in the loop as well yeah and i, I think going back to um you know, another book that, that's been mentioned to me many times and one that's been on my to read list for, to read list for probably uh, longer than I would care to admit, but is Thinking in Systems by Dan Danella Meadows. Uh, I know that one. And again, in like in thinking from that systems perspective, but I haven't read it yet. So I, I want to read it first to see sort of how much overlap is there potentially with impact networks. And I, I don't want us digging like too deep on just, you know, a step away from each other materials. I'd rather we take kind of like big leaps and bounce around uh, and get exposed to very different ideas and then bring it all back um, together. Uh, so yeah, I have some other thoughts. And again, if anyone does uh, have any desire to like help think some of this through, obviously the desired future state is we would have community voting mechanisms, et cetera. Um, given the amount of new things that are starting to prop up, I'm, I'm worried that we're spreading our community attention a little thin at the moment. So I don't want to introduce too many asks of community running things at the same time. So please come to me if you want to help plan and structure this. I, I definitely need some help in, in driving that bit forward uh, and would love to collaborate with others in thinking through what are those books and materials and podcasts and whatever 
um, which actually relates to, I guess, something else is another quick uh, tangent in, in, I guess, small announcement of sorts. I don't know if it warrants being an announcement. Um, but starting next week, uh, at least every other week, I will try to do effectively like an office hours. I, I don't like calling it that. Uh, but just like I, I'm going to hop in on Discord and just announce like, hey, if anyone wants to come like co-work or just, you know, uh, water cooler chat or grill me about anything in specific, uh, all of that is on the table and just creating more opportunities for, for folks to just interact beyond the community call. This year, I feel like it's presentation. There are a few folks who feel very comfortable jumping in on audio and video. Um, but yeah, we get that not everyone might be uh, in that position. So just creating more interaction points uh, where we can hopefully have places to uh, both discuss and solidify things such as norms, culture, et cetera. Uh, and yeah, just get, get more bonded with each other. Um, so yeah, uh, look out for that uh, next week. Um, but yeah, I realize we've we've taken a, a couple of awesome tangents. I guess before we before I pull it back uh, towards that intersection of network mindset and project management, uh, is there anything else? Um, yeah, around kind of the norms, around the reading groups, around uh, just the systems level of what is the mindset necessary uh, for operating in that kind of environment. Anything in those directions before I, I pivot us back. And conversely, if there's just you want to take it in a different re uh, direction relating to networks and SCURF, uh, super open to that as well. The goal here is just to have a, a conversation around networks, what we're doing at SCURF, and how we can best improve. So happy to uh, to drive that elsewhere if that gets folks excited. In the meantime, though, coming back to uh, the network mindset bit uh, and, uh, and, and project management, and I think it's interesting discussing some of the elements that 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 had just come up because i know uh, i don't know if eric is with us on this call today uh but one thing i know I, i've noticed in kind of the environment that he comes from and inesh as well i don't uh, i don't know if everyone's had a chance to, to meet them or work with them yet um but they are very big even at the project level of whenever you're starting project documentation actually highlighting what is the north star of the project uh, which you know needs alignment to a larger kind of a north star for the organization and, and vision, mission, et cetera, for the organization. So uh, it's interesting just to think through some of these elements that are coming up, and which on the surface, something I could see how project management, mission, vision, culture, norms can seem like very uh, separate topics, but in reality are all very intimately related and deeply affect the actual operations uh, and day-to-day -day lived culture of an organization. Um, I guess a, a general question that slightly strays away, uh, away from the network side and more just on the mindset side of things, have folks found good examples either through in your own life, word of mouth, uh, learned about it elsewhere, but again, just with actual things that help people think in more of that network mindset? Um, yeah, just to helping to reframe uh, mindset around being more focused on the individual nodes to the overall system. Has anyone found anything uh, that, that particularly spoke to them? Uh, while folks think I'll, I'll just answer a bit on my end, I know, uh, oh, actually there's someone already, so I will let Chris jump in. Yeah, um, one of the, the metaphors that's used is that love and spoke in the wheel. And I, I had heard that metaphor uh, for communities through uh, martial arts, Tai Chi training as like Taoism would represent like the individual is just a spoke within a hub of a wheel that has many spokes. So you have to have all of the spokes for the wheel to roll, but the individual spokes are necessary, but it's the many spokes that make the wheel functional. So I think it was like the hub and spoke metaphor, I'm not sure where he, he drew it from, but I've seen it, like I said, in uh, my martial arts research that they also teach you about like the history of Taoism and the process, like that metaphor is like one that's very prevalent and it's easy, it's easy to remember because of the way a wheel works. Um, so I think that specific example is one that it like instantly drew me back to that that Taoist like representation of that concept, but also it's like I think if people struggle to understand how the networks 
operate together. The hub and spokes are, it's like a very clear, like if you know how a wheel works and how it supports a vehicle, it's like it, it becomes very clear having a hub and spoke as a network would help move progress forward. Yeah, it's interesting to think how sports, martial arts, uh, and yeah, various kind of uh, communal group activities, which is interesting because martial arts, uh, a lot of the time, especially from folks who haven't gone through it, it can seem like it's much more individualistic. So how does that actually fit into the hub and spoke? Where, where in reality, it is, it is very deeply part of the philosophy there. Um, but yeah, thank you for, for bringing that up. Uh, Fotis, I see you got your virtual hand up. Please jump in. Yeah, so I have probably thousands of <laughs> resources there in terms of that because my own background, which is very idiosyncratic, uh, uh, in cognitive science uh, was from a very, very, very um, on an orthodox perspective because in cognitive science it is very neurocentric. It is uh, usually like the idea of the psychological subject, which is an individual, which is unified and uh, which exists on its own, is what is like the, what is called the Cartesian subject in uh, both in uh, cognitive science and in the history of philosophy that actually informed this um, um, its basic notions. Um, it's very, it's very. Um, there's a history that is hard to, um, uh, I don't know, cannot find words today. The heat is uh, getting to me. Yeah, it basically, it's hard to get over these notions. And there is a, um, a movement right now in contemporary uh, cognitive science that deals with social cognition and, and found out that, uh, wait, to actually do research on social cognition, we have to uh, start from a very different theoretical framework. <laughs> uh, for example, there's uh, some very nice research on social neuroscience, which you wouldn't expect like these two words to match, to, to, to find them uh, together. Um, that shows that actually the default neural activity uh, of people who are interacting together is fundamentally different from when they are alone. And uh, when they are uh, doing the same task alone and in groups, it also changes. And there's no way to induce this activity uh, in any way when, the, uh, in, when somebody is um, doing the task alone. So there's something uh, that comes up in a social um situation that is not only different from um from um observe, so from a behavioral point of view but it's also different from the whole um fr from the inside out let's say um and that shocked me uh but there's like an enormous amount of literature concerning that and there's a whole um approach which is called an activism which I don't know how many people here might have heard of uh, and are familiar with. And I'd be happy to do a primer or to uh, get people uh, up to date with what's happening, which is which is it's very interesting, especially the notions of intersubjectivity and participatory sense making, uh, which are starting to make uh, uh, their uh, presence felt in contemporary literature in cognitive science. Yeah, thank you for, for bringing that up and bringing it to, to the neuroscience dimension. Yeah, I would definitely be happy to chat about, excuse me, an activism and just generally go down that rabbit hole. Uh, either we could do a separate breakout for anyone who particularly wants to, or we could uh, take over a future community call if there's wide enough interest in something like that. But I mean, it's an interesting thing that I've even been thinking through on like a deeply personal level, whereas, especially with like bouncing around and traveling in the last year, I've spent a lot more time in solitude uh, as opposed to in, in like organized community and organized them using loosely of just like family, friends, whatever, you know, whatever structures are in place in, uh, in specific environments. And 
like the transition is very interesting like the emotional transition from solitude into communal living a lot of the time has this inevitable of like oh geez why am i doing this it's easier to just be alone and like if you push through long enough there's like a benefit on the other end so there's the other end there's like the the dimension of like knowing the phases and knowing uh how to what are sort of the philosophical views that can get people thinking certain ways but then even when you know the process of change as it happens the actual experience of change is its own complicated layer that like how many times have we want to be like oh i need to stop doing x in my life on a daily basis and like getting rid of a habit is actually much harder than it would seem on the surface and there yeah i i always get fascinated in both the actual uh, sort of the philosophical layer and the applied emotional existence layer and the, sort of how do those two actually interact with each other and from an education perspective and, and a communal systems whatever structuring perspective how do you actually help people go through those kinds of journeys and want to um and i i even remember as a small example i just remember hearing a podcast uh right after i got lyme disease and it was two people talking about uh, like oh we went through all this personal growth and all this change and we went down this journey and it's like at the end of a hour hour and a half long conversation they were both like oh well, what started it for for each one of you and it happened to be uh like uh experiencing your own mortality due to lyme disease for both of them started this journey which obviously when i heard it when i was going through that myself was a very interesting experience interacting with but yeah there, there's still the i'm getting dangerously close to just rambling at this point but like the, the the personal side of actual change is something that absolutely fascinates me uh especially my, i grew up with psychotherapists and uh, have seen a lot of examples of like the desired stated intention of change and then it doesn't happen and like it's happened so many times in my own life and how do we systematically help people accomplish change and there's so many schools of thought from the purely philosophical to like dealing with addiction and dealing with all kinds of other areas and like all these various schools of thought but like there is no just a to z here's you know follow these instructions and 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 things just, and you know, like you're in a network mindset or you're thinking as part of a collective or you know how to effectively and consistently make habit change happen uh with no regression and process um yeah it's a, it's a very interesting uh fusion of kind of topics and, and challenge types but i i feel like I, I got myself excited based on hearing some of what you said and might have went down a rabbit hole that no one else cares about um but yeah, I realized we are getting towards the general back end of uh, of today's conversation. So I do want to leave it open for another moment or two to see if anyone else has anything they want to talk about in this direction. Otherwise, I do just want to give a quick um, update on a, a project relating to network mapping that seems like it's slowly coming together. Uh, and just to yeah, flow that uh, throw that out there and, and get some reactions quickly. Seems like no more questions on the PM network mindset, et cetera side. So thank you all for indulging me on that one. Uh, hopefully you all enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Um, but yeah, so one thing I did wanna quickly announce is we actually just got approved uh, to do a capstone project with Carnegie Mellon, uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, and the, the capstone project is going to be focused on um, network mapping and establishing effectively uh, trying to build an open database using uh, focusing on pointers, not actually like housing the end material, but to create a database of pointers around research that's relevant to Web3 pretty much since this since the Satoshi paper came out in uh, in October 31st, uh, 20, 2008. Um, and so since that amount of time, get a full scrape of the general knowledge index, which is I think like a 20 petabyte, 40 petabyte data set of a massive amount of research, as well as Google Scholar API, use those as the basis of just scraping uh, a lot of publicly available data uh, in terms of research, start categorizing it and actually forming it um, with the intention uh, so that we can actually then have this data set upon that we can pull into social network graphs and get a sense by content category where are their concentrations of activity and research production in terms of both in uh, academia and industry to better help us understand what are the existing networks already in place around each different topic uh, around web3 research and what are the what are the forms of network support that are needed by content category right so like 
cryptography might have different needs of support in advance in, in trying to advance that space uh, as opposed to governance or as opposed to mechanism design or scaling or etc. So uh, trying to actually use this kind of mapping exercise as the first step in understanding a, a map of who's been doing what. Uh, and then separately, there there have been some exercises uh, both internally at SCURP, and I don't know if uh, anyone saw Daniel Ospina post uh, a couple weeks back, but the idea of actually mapping, excuse me, mapping um, problems from industry uh, and pull uh, problem statements from folks in industry. And so we have a list of who's doing what, uh, or a map of who's doing what, we have a map of problems, then we can actually Again, coming back to the how do we best uh, think about network support, what's missing and what can we add and what what, what is the very concrete role SCURF can play to advance very narrow areas. Um, that's where I, I'm really excited to see what we can do once we have this kind of mapping in place. Uh, and then separately, we have some folks who uh, between governance and between cryptography have been taking a stab at more uh, bottom-up mapping of sort of what is the actual interaction types, what's happening in the space right now, where are the active communities, uh, and something that, you know, just a huge data exercise would not be able to give you insight in. Uh, and then someone else has been kind of doing some mapping on cryptography education uh, and what those pathways can actually look like as well. So I'm, I'm really excited and we'll, we'll present in future calls on some of these other things. Um, but yeah, just wanted to let the community know, uh, I was just very excited to see that we got that project approved at uh, at CMU with this capstone. So if there is anyone here who is also particularly interested in network mapping, social network graphs, all of that kind of fun stuff, uh, let me know, because uh, we're still building out what the, the project team will look like from our side, uh, and we'll have four to six students from the CMU side, but we'll only get clarity on that in about a month's time or so. Um, so yeah, that was an update there. If anyone has any questions, let me know. The last thing that I will mention for today is community calls going forward. Um, so I did want to just quickly um, talk about the community calls going forward uh, to also hopefully start getting more input from the community uh, because I know we're gonna, there should be a GitHub board coming soon where folks will be able to actually propose ideas uh, for what topics you want to get into. Um, uh, this is not zooming, um, but yeah. So today we're we're gonna we had a conversation that happened. Next week, uh, Hazel and Fotis are, are open to presenting on community cross pollination. So we'll hear a little bit about that. Um, the following week, and Sammy, I saw you commented in chat. Sorry, I haven't had a chance to reach out to you yet. But I actually just talked to someone who uh, is doing some interesting work around non-transferable NFTs and social network graphs. Uh, and Sammy, for those who don't know, uh, is working on a project called Etherscore, uh, which, and sorry if this is a crude oversimplification, please feel free to correct me, um, but basically thinking about non-transferable NFTs in the context of uh, effectively interaction with DeFi so you could uh, get a way of understanding like an informal DeFi credit score, so to say. So I was thinking we could potentially host a group conversation around reputation and the use of non-transferable NFTs and research networks and what does that mean? Um, you know, one of these at some point we'll talk about network mapping um, and, and the project I briefly alluded to. Uh, and then, yeah, we have uh, Daniel from Act Inf Active Inference Lab wanting to present uh, in late August. Uh, we have Antoine who was supposed to present here a month and a half ago when he had a family thing come up. Uh, so he's open to presenting on deliberative decision making uh, at a later point. Uh, we obviously would not need to present twice on the same topic. I just forgot to delete that. Um, so yeah, uh, A, just signaling and transparency to the community. This is some stuff coming up. Call to action. Please let us know if you have ideas or want to hear specific topics brought up or want to hear certain conversations happen. Uh, until we have formalized the way for you all to do that through GitHub, uh, please just DM either Paul or myself. Uh, get in touch with us. Uh, and we can figure out, uh, yeah, what ideas make sense, uh, and then get them planned, get them on the schedule, et cetera, for now. Um, yeah, and I think that is it on my end. So I see, uh, yeah, we wrapped up slightly early. If anyone does have any kind of a quick question or anything, happy to give a little time to that. And if there are no other questions or anything for now, I'll hang out till we hit the hour. Uh, but we can wrap a minute, minute and a half early. 
and give back some time to everyone. And yeah, I just want to say thank you. Really appreciate you choosing to spend a uh, part of your Thursday with us here. And yeah, please feel free to reach out if uh, anything in particular from uh, the reading group to the network mapping, uh, to community calls, to helping us with mission vision or any of these other things. If any of these things sound exciting to you, uh, please reach out uh, directly and, and we'll figure out how to get you best plugged in as we kind of formalize those, uh, those projects. But yeah, thank you all and I hope you enjoy the rest of your Thursday wherever you are in the world.